Thank you, Brother Tony. Yes. One of the best tools we have in our church right here, that prayer list to get it out and pray over it. Take it before God. If you have your Bibles with you this evening, please open with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16. We'll start in verse 1 in just a minute. 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16. But I want to uh, begin with a little bit of a review uh, of because tonight, I don't usually t- title uh, Bible studies, but tonight I'm going to title this God's King. God is choosing a king. God is choosing a king. The people that already chose a king. And uh, Samuel loved that king, King Saul. But back in chapter 13, God has said to King Saul through Samuel, But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. So he says to King Saul, your son and your grandsons will not reign. Now Saul's going to go ahead and reign after this for another 38 years or so. But he's saying to him that your dynasty is over because you did not obey the commandments of the Lord. Then last week we saw where that Saul himself is rejected, God tells him to go and destroy all the Amalekites. All the Amalekites. And he calls and he meets Samuel and says, I've done what you said. And verse 14, one of the most famous verses in the Bible, Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the loin of the oxen which I hear? You've been told on. You did not fulfill the commandments of God. You're supposed to kill all the animals. All the humans, you're supposed to give all that as a dedication to God. So he starts making excuses. The people this, the people this. And here's, they, they want to keep some of this for sacrifices. Look at verse 22. A verse that do us all to live by. <coughs> Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken than the fat of rams. That's what God still wants out of our lives. He wants obedience. He does. You know what partial obedience is? That's disobedience. Right. He wants us to be obedient people to Him. For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, verse twenty-three, and stubbornness as the iniquity, as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, He also hath rejected thee from being king. You're no longer going to be king. He grabs a hold of Samuel. Oh, King Saul does and says, please go with me, please do. And he tears Samuel's garment. And verse 28, Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from you this day, and hath given it to thy neighbor, to a neighbor of thine, that is better than thou. Now, he may just say back in chapter 13, David wasn't even born yet. At this time that he says this, David is probably a young child maybe 14, 15 years old. And a couple of months passes, and that's where we pick up here in verse 16. Oh, don't forget, in the meantime, even though he didn't fulfill the commandment of God, old old Samuel, who now is close to 80 years old, says, bring me Agag, the king. (laughs) And Agag comes thinking everything's fine. Samuel says, somebody give me a sword. And Samuel, usually covered with blood of sacrifices, Hacks Agag into pieces. Whew. I mean, that's straightforward, isn't it, guys? That's what God wants us to do with our sin. Get rid of our sin. Don't. Jesus said it'd be better to go into hell. Uh, I mean, going to heaven with one eye. So if your eye offends you, pluck. He doesn't mean literally pluck your eye out, but he said it would even be better. So what he's basically saying is, and he said, if your hand offends, they cut it off. He's saying this: Don't try to taper off your sins. Stop your sins. Have any of y'all ever been stopped for running a stop sign? Which is a weird thing. Have any of you? No, none of you? I'm the only one, I guess. Okay. Okay, so I'm running the stop sign. Uh, the one I usually run at the end of our road there in Murfreesboro. It's out in the middle of cow pasture. There ain't nothing around but cows and me. And some skunks, usually some skunks dead in the road there. And I run it, it happens to be coming up Highway uh, 99 there. Uh, state trooper, and he pulls me over. He says, uh, you know that you ran through that stop sign. Yeah. 
I started to say this, but I didn't think it helped me any. But I did hear about a crazy illustration when this guy said, well, I just kind of almost stopped. And this uh, policeman gets out his billy club, starts beating him in the head, said, you want me to stop or I almost stop? Well, that's what God said. You can't almost stop. Cut off your sin. Hack it up. All right, so that's the last lesson we looked at last week. All right, now, a few months or some weeks have gone by. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul? You're mourning for him as someone that had died. See, and I have rejected him. You didn't call him, and you can't reject him. But I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. But Samuel loves Saul so much. He loves Saul. He had anointed Saul's king. Now by this time, see, from chapter, thir chapter 13 to chapter 15, about 20 years have went by. So Saul's been king for 20 to 25 years at this point. And uh, he said, I'm rejected him from being king. And so uh, quit mourning. It's not your job to do that. Here's what I want you to do. Fill thine horn with oil. Take the, one of those ram's horns and Fill it up with oil. And I will send thee to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. For I have provided me a king. Me a king. I highlighted that. Me a king among his sons. Now, Samuel don't let God. Have you ever. I know this usually happens when you're talking to your children. You're getting ready to tell them something. And halfway through telling them. They start arguing. You haven't even finished telling them the whole story yet. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what happens here. In fact, let's skip verse 2 for just a second and, and you'll see what the plan is. And then we'll see his arguments. Take your oil and go down to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Verse 3. And call Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto, unto me him whom I name unto thee. But in the middle of God telling him in this, Samuel said, How can I go? I can't go. If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And it's like the Lord says, shh, shh, hush, why? like you have to do your kids. Let me finish telling you. He's not going to kill you because here's what we're going to do. And the Lord said, take a heifer with thee and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord because that's what you're going to do. You're going to take a heifer. That, that's a cow that hasn't calved yet. And you're going to, going to take that with you and you're going to offer it as a sacrifice to God. So, we have his commandment here. What does Samuel have to do? He has to go and anoint one of Jesse's sons as king. We know who that's going to be, don't we? David. David. Did you know the name David is mentioned twice in the, at the end of the book of of. Uh, uh, of Ruth, just saying that, that she was in his lineage, that Ruth and Boaz were in his lineage. So it lists his name twice there in the lineage. But we're going to finally meet David here about 150 years later. And you know what else you're going to find out? That David is going to be mentioned more in the Bible. And nobody else has ever named David. He is the only David in the Bible. And he is going to be mentioned more than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all put together. But all of them together are mentioned about 500 times. He's going to be mentioned more than Moses. Moses is mentioned over, five, over 850 times. David is going to be mentioned over 1,050 times. Can you imagine that? This man gets a lot of press here. I mean a lot. Even more than Moses. Samuel's only mentioned like a, less than 200. So if you put Samuel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all together, you still wouldn't come up to Moses or David. But here's this man, David, okay? God's going to anoint him. And that's what we're going to see here. And we'll spend most of our time tonight on these first few verses here, <laughs> verse 13 verses. But So he says to him, go do this. And here's a lesson I want to point out. And I think this is a good lesson for us to pick up on. God leads us step by step. Not usually with a full blueprint or a road map. In fact, Psalm 37 says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And so, wouldn't it be nice if God would tell you exactly what to do next week? I mean, everything. You just send a big email with the, here's what you do Monday morning, here's what you do Monday afternoon. But that's not how life works, is it? That's not how a Christian life works. He says, follow me. 
<laughs> every once in a while he'll give you a leading to do something, and you better be obedient to that. But as you start doing it then, then he'll lead you how to do it. So step by step, step by step. But that's, a, that's, a, that's not just a good lesson for new Christians. That's a good lesson for all Christians. As He doesn't lead us with a road map. He leads us step by step. So that's what he's doing with Samuel right now. And I still think it would be pretty cool to be Samuel because God talks to Samuel. And Samuel talks to God. They just talk. I mean, and I think that's amazing. And God talks to him. And he's writing the Word of God. Samuel writes much of the Word of God. So, verse 4 and 5. Now Samuel did that which the Lord spake. He overcame his fears or doubts or his mourning. Maybe he didn't even want to go because he wanted to keep Saul as king. And he came to Bethlehem. The elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to sacrifice. So, are you coming peaceably? That's a good question for Samuel, isn't it? This is not part of his regular circuit that he went on. This is a little bit further south. And when Samuel comes, lots of times judgment comes. Are you come peaceably? Or have you come to bring judgment on our little town of Bethlehem? And he says, I've come with peace. I have come with peace in my heart. And he comes with peace. He comes with the peace of God. And then I I made some notes about Bethlehem. I'm sure that you know all of these facts already. Bethlehem means what? House of? House of bread. And because they supply the wheat and the barley for most of that part of Israel, and uh, at this time that would be supplying the king's family, all of that southern Judah and, and uh, southern Benjamin, all this area. So they, that's a house of bread. And it's already famous because a thousand years before this, <coughs> Rachel had died there. Before there were Jews had taken over the land. This was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is Jacob, Abraham's grandson. And she dies giving birth to their youngest son, to his last son also, of course her last. She dies giving birth to Benjamin there at Bethlehem. Her, her sepulcher is there. If you go to Bethlehem, our God wouldn't take us to the sepulcher. It, Bethlehem is still partly a, a disputed area, so we couldn't go there. I asked a lot of questions, didn't I, Debbie? So I, was, I did talk about going to see Hezekiah's temple, I mean, Hezekiah's tunnels. It, it's not on the list. <laughs> and I kept begging until some other people said, why don't we go see those tunnels? That sounds cool. So finally he did at least take us there, and we did go all the way through. The, it's, I thought it was pretty cool. But anyhow, that's a whole different story. We'll talk about them when we get to King Hezekiah. But uh, she's buried there. Number three, more than 150 years before this, Boaz and Ruth <laughs> were married there. You remember that whole story of Ruth. You might think, why is this little story here? That whole little story is there. Of course, we know because we've read dozens of times. Because when you get to the last few verses, it says, And Boaz and Ruth gave birth to Obed. And Obed gave birth, was a, was a father of Jesse. And Jesse was a father of David. So it tells us that's why. Because this Moabite woman is in the lineage of, of David, which means she's in the lineage of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then da- David's born there, number four. David makes the town very famous, the town of David. And of course, it's forever now identified with our Savior, the Son of David, isn't it? The bread of life is born in the house of bread. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. We sing about it. All across the world, people sing about that little town of Bethlehem over and over again. It's not forgotten. Well, this is that town. Well, at this time would be about four and a half, maybe five miles from Jerusalem. If you go there now, it's just one big town. Bethlehem and Jerusalem run into each other. There's just a sign that says you're leaving Jerusalem, you're in Bethlehem. They run into each other. But uh, So he's going there to Bethlehem, and he's coming in peace. They may also say you're coming in peace because uh, it hacked up Agag just a few months before this. I mean, that gives you a pretty... I mean, you're a pretty tough old man if you go around hacking up kings, right? Mm-hmm. You go around attacking somebody to death. This guy wasn't dead and he hacked, he hacked him up to death. He killed him. So he says, I've come in peace. And it came to pass when they were come, and he looked at Eliab, 
that's the oldest son of, of, of Jesse, and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, now this is, this is Samuel talking to God, not out loud probably, he didn't say that out loud, and God's not talking to Samuel out loud, but God speaks to Samuel. Samuel knows, he knows it's God's voice. The Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Wow. We all know that passage, don't we? The Lord looks on the heart. Now when it says he refused him, it doesn't mean altogether that, that uh, Eliab was a bad man. Uh, it doesn't seem like he and David have a good relationship. In fact, it doesn't seem like David has a good relationship with any of his brothers. Uh, even when he becomes king, he has a great relationship with these two sisters. They love him and he loves them. He takes their sons to be the captains of his army. So you've got to remember, David's so much younger. His older sisters and, and brother probably have children by now. You know, David's 15. and they're, So they would be in their 30s, you know. So they already have children. And, uh, but, uh, it's really something. Guys, when you start talking about families like this, with, with these, with ten children, that's a lot of children, isn't it? I mean, it really is. That's a big old family. And I think about my dad's family. There were 22 of them. And when he, when the, when he was born, he had nieces and nephews, eight and ten years old. By the time that Randa's born, she's six years younger than dad, she has teenagers, and that's her nieces and nephews. By the time Aunt Randa was eight years old, she had her sisters had grandchildren. <laughs> And that's something, because they were so much older than her. You know, you have 22 kids, that's a bunch of kids. Well, so that's not that, that, it's not that, I don't want you to think he's an evil man. He's refused because he's not who God is wanting for this particular job. He may be a perfectly good Jewish man, even though it doesn't seem like he and David. I mean, you don't read about him and uh, have anything with his family like he does his sister's uh, children. But, uh, so the Lord looks on the inward part in the heart and uh, I want to talk about that just for a second God always looks at the heart when I'm looking in the New Testament and God calls this other man named Saul Saul of Tarsus Aaron I would have never called him he was a murderer not just any murder he murdered Christians and he was traveling to Damascus with Letters to murder more Christians or imprison them if they would not reject Jesus, that he would have them put to death. And yet God says, That's my man. God saw something in his heart. And he becomes, he writes more books of the Bible than anyone else. He becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. Thank God that's you and me, Gentiles. We have Gentile blood in us. He becomes their apostle. And then, then I, I, I'll just wrote down a couple other examples. I don't think I'd have chose Peter. Andrew, yes, Andrew's a man of great character, but Peter, it seems like he's always, he tries to kill a man when they come to rent. Peter tries to kill a guy. Gideon, what a coward. Gideon's hiding in the threshing floor at night, afraid to even thresh out in the daytime or thresh out on the hill. And God comes to Gideon and says, you are the man of valor I will use to rescue Israel. What? Again, he's the youngest kid in his family too youngest man, uh, man in his family and God sees something in Gideon's heart that says you are a man of valor Gideon's hiding in fear not much of a man of valor is he but I'm glad that God doesn't see us like we are he sees our heart and he wants to do something with us and that I'm fully convinced of that God that when David is ready to die he brings his son Solomon before him in 1 Chronicles Chapter 28, and he says, Solomon, I'm going to tell you the most important thing I can ever tell you. Keep your heart pure before God because God will look at your heart. So David knew this. David did so much. I wonder about what it says. David did, uh, I'm looking for your neighbor that's better than you. A man after my own heart. And I'm wondering, man, he seemed like he did a lot worse things than King Saul did. In fact, Lord's willing, after this, this Sunday, Lord's willing, we'll finish uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And I'm going to take a break from 1 Corinthians. It's a tough book, guys. So uh, uh, no, two weeks from now, we'll, after that, we'll be doing 
Easter, we'll be preaching the resurrection. Hallelujah, my favorite time of the year. But then because we'll have good Friday service on Friday, and then we'll have Easter resurrection service, uh, sunrise service Sunday morning before the sun comes up, and then have Easter celebration together. But between that, when we finish 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the Lord's willing this week, I want to preach a message on King David, a character study. Now, not that would take weeks and weeks, but just one character, one question. Why was he a man after God's own heart? And I'm going to try to delve into a little bit about that. What made him a man after God's own heart? Why was he a man after God's own heart? So we're going to look at a few reasons. I'm sure it doesn't capture all of it, but Lord's willing, that's what we're going to do that. So, so he's, he's out here. He says, that's not the one. Then Jesse called Abinadab, made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither that the Lord chosen this one. I know the King James just says this, but in the Hebrew, it's this one. Jesse made Shema to pass by. And he said, Neither that the Lord chose this one. And then the King James says again, but it's actually after. After. He didn't mean that he makes them all go twice. After Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel, Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. Now, he talked to me, and I came down here, which would be from where he was at to get to Bethlehem for a man his age dragging a calf with him is about a two to three day journey. So he's tra And he has to go right by Saul's house on the way down. So he's got to stop in and see Saul. Where are you going? Because there's no way if you avoid Saul, then it's trouble, right? So he's got to stop in and see Saul on his way down. Okay, so, and no, these aren't right. These are not right. <sighs> well, God knows what he's doing. And so here's what we're going to read. Verse 3, verse 11 through 13. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are here all thy children? He said, There remaineth yet the youngest. Now, how would you feel if your dad and brothers got invited to, and you were invited to, I say, bring all your sons. And you're going to have a big, because they don't eat a lot of meat in those days. And you're going to come to a sacrifice from the man of, all of, by now, people started to know Samuel when he was 12 years old. Remember, said the nation knew who he was. So now he's led them through battle. He's ordained the king. He's done all these things. He's written the word of God. And Samuel comes to your town and says, bring your children. What, do you brought all of them? This has to be a big insult to David. You know, i got another, but he's kind of a hippie and he likes playing the guitar and he stays out in the field all the time. Well, if I had seven big brothers, I think I'd stay in the field a lot too, you know. You know, big brothers can torment you sometimes, you know. I think that's why he loved his sister so much. And he, he never ever says anything great, David doesn't, about his dad, Jesse. Though Jesse was a great man of God. You find out from other people. But Jesse, but David, when he talks about his mother, he calls the handmaiden of the Lord. Again, the handmaiden of the Lord. He writes a poetry about his mother. But uh, anyhow, so, but Jesse doesn't even bring him. And he's not like he's a two-year-old. He's 15 years old. Now, I know that because you can, first of all, that's what all the ancient rabbis say. They spent all their life studying this. But also you can go from 15 years old, what happens the next 15 years, and it says he becomes the king at age 30, so you can subtract back. So, so he doesn't even bring, doesn't even bring David to the, to the big party. Okay, so, behold, he keepeth the sheep. Well, you'll find out that Jesse has some money. He has servants. But, uh, I don't know. He doesn't seem like he fits in, David Dutton. His brothers evidently all have raven black hair. You know, dark eyes. And he's kind of the music one. He writes poetry. And I'm sure his mom loves that. In fact, you know what the name David means, David? You know, don't you? Beloved. Beloved, yeah. That's the name your mommy gives you. That's not usually the name your daddy gives you. So his mommy names him, my beloved, my little precious, you know. A little beloved. And so uh, he's out keeping the sheep. Because he'll write about that at times. Well, I know he doesn't write Psalm 23 until he's an older man. But you can still feel some of the young David in when you read Psalm 23, can't you? The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. David's an old man that's been through many wars and stuff, and he writes the 23rd Psalm. But you can still feel that youngness in his heart when he writes that, about the days that he spent with the sheep, the days he was out there, you know. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for he will not sit down 
till he come hither. Now, so it would be a couple of hours by the time you would start. You'd, you'd get together, all the men that he invited, several of the town, the town elders, evidently all of Jesse's sons, seven of Jesse's sons are there, Jesse's there. There's a good group of men there. So they would eat some other things. Then Samuel would, in front of them, slay the beast. And then they would do the proper skinning, all those sort of things. And then they would start cooking the sacrifice. It, it's not a sin offering. It's not going to all be burnt to God. It's a fellowship offering. So part of it will be burnt completely to God. Part of it will be taken off at just the right time and served to the men of the town as a big feast. So he said, we're not sitting down. To you. Now, it said that he sanctified them. So they all had to take a bath. You don't go to a sacrifice with Samuel till you take a bath. So you say, well, don't everybody bath? We think about it in our society, but... Uh, uh, in fact, Debbie, she can't watch cowboy movies. Why, Debbie? Because they don't take baths outside, <laughs> you know. So, so you know, she's a clean woman right here, okay? So you have to get cleaned up to go see Samuel because God wants you to be sanctified. You've got to clean your flesh. And you're going to appear before God's man and God himself in the sacrifice. So, so they've got to wait for David to go be found with the sheep and then to be cleaned up and brought. He says, we're not doing anything until he gets here. And he sent and brought him in. Now look at the description of David. He was ruddy. That means red or light brown. So his face is, his face is more olive skin, not as dark as his brother's. And when we were in Israel, we, I noticed, because I kept looking around uh, for people, and the, most of them would be very dark hair. But every once in a while you see someone with just a little bit of red or reddish brown in it. You know, there's some Jews like that. Uh, not not a lot. And almost always they would have the same eye color because that says the King James and with all the beautiful countenance. But actually in the Hebrew it says he had light eyes. That's what the word is. He had light eyes. So his eyes are like green or hazel. And uh, now like this. And his family might not have thought so, but it says, God said, he's good to look at. <laughs> I made him. David writes another song about that, don't he? I was fearfully and wonderfully made. David writes a song, a song about, you know, how God thought he was good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. They don't know exactly what's going on. Even sometime later, they don't seem to recognize him as king. Again, this is not in the scriptures, but it seems to be implied very strongly. And the ancient rabbis all say this, that, that when Samuel anointed him, he didn't tell his dad, but he told Samuel, he told, he told David, you are the king. They think he's been anointed. For, you're anointed for some particular service to the king or service to God. <laughs> so they know there's something about David. But in just a little while, you'll see David becomes the personal musician of Saul, so maybe they thought that's what it's for. But but David knows. You can tell by the way that he acts. He knows. The Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose and went to find crowns for him. No, that's not what it says. Is it? <laughs> Samuel rose and goes back to Ramah. I don't know how happy Samuel is about this because he really loves Saul. Saul will reign for about another 15 years. But uh, he's anointed David. David is the anointed one. All right, so let's talk about this a little bit. So David is keeping the sheep. And I made a little note. That's great training. You lead sheep and you drive cattle. He had to learn to lead people, to lead the sheep, to care for them. In fact, another place to say later on, Samuel will say, no, no, God says to David, I took you when you were watching the, ewe, the ewes bearing lambs. David took particular good care of the, of the female sheep as they were getting ready to bear lambs. Evidently, he was really good at that. He didn't lose the lambs. He, he made sure they were live births and stuff. And so he knows how to do this stuff. God calls people when we're busy. Here's another lesson. Now, there may be lots of lessons the Holy Spirit speaking to you. I just wrote down three or four. First one is God leads us step by step. And here... God calls us when we're busy. He called Moses when he was watching his father-in-law's sheep, didn't he? He called Gideon when he was threshing grain. He called Matthew when he was out riding tax receipts at the receipt of custom. He called John and Andrew while they were mending nets. 
And so stay busy until God tells you to do something else. Some people say, if God would just tell me what to do, I'd do it. Well, I tell you what, find something to do. Find something to do. It's do that until he tells you something else to do. Be faithful. Do what it do. Do something. Find something. I love Isaac because Isaac doesn't have get all the print that, that Abraham and Jacob does. It's like Isaac, the man of God, is in the middle there. Uh, Abraham's son and Isaac and, uh, and, and Jacob's father. But I love this one story about Isaac. It said that he had dug a well. And the Midianites came and they filled up his well. You know what he did? He dug another well. And they came and filled up his well. You know what he did? He dug another well. And God gave him that well. And I always think, uh, just, some people say, I'm afraid I'll do something wrong. Well, so what? Maybe they'll fill up your well. Do you? Don't go dig again. Just do something for God. Be now. It's not. I'm not saying it's not. Right. It's good to have quiet time to be able to spend time alone with God, and that's that's one thing I treasure very much now. Is uh, for the last several months, I I love just getting up early and get me a cup of coffee, and and I, I don't do Bible study. I'm going to preach and teach to you guys. I just do reading for myself. Just let my soul get fed and read the Word of God. And, and I, I enjoy that. And uh, so quiet time is important. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying God never calls anybody when they're a pew potato. And, you know, couch potatoes are pew potatoes. That's when they come to church and sit on the pews, okay? So do something. Get Find something. I'm sure God can use you somehow in some way. All right. I told you what it looked like. Okay. He poured the oil upon him. That's a symbol that he's been set aside for God. David. First time that he's mentioned here. Verse 13. 1 Samuel chapter 16. We've come through half the Old Testament, I'd say, or close to it. And we finally meet this man, David. And we'll still be reading about him in the book of Revelation because it says, Jesus, the son of David. That's that same, that's that same David right here. The same David. The man of God. It fails God so many times. We'll, we'll wait for Sunday's message to talk about that. Though. Okay, so <coughs> the Spirit of God moves upon David and that is what makes all the difference. The Spirit of the Lord moved on David. He's already been writing songs, but now his songs are chosen more, powerful. It's actually one Bible commentary I read. I think it was uh, Howard Voss said, the Spirit of enablement came upon him. <coughs> And that's what I pray. Every day, Brother Danny, I pray. Lord, enable me. Anoint me, Lord God. I want to be, I want to have the power of God on my life. I want to walk with God. I want to walk with God so much that people start saying, He's so heavenly minded, He's no earthly good. Because that's the most untrue thing you've ever heard. I know a lot of people so earthly minded, they ain't worth a nickel to heaven. <laughs> I don't know anybody so heavenly minded they're not. If you're heavenly minded, you'll be worth a lot on earth because you'll be doing God's will. Okay. And I pray that. Debbie prays it with me. I pray, God, give me your anointing. Enable me to be a true man of God and uh, be faithful to you. Whatever you call me to do, that's what I want to be faithful to do. All right, verse 14. We'll go a lot faster now, especially after we finish verse 14. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Actually, the Hebrew word terrified him. Saul was terrified because he knew the Spirit of God had been withdrawn from him. Now, I want to start out by saying a couple things. Number one, nobody that's in Christ can have the Spirit of God taken from them. Do you realize, if you're in Christ, you cannot have the Spirit of God taken from you. So you say, oh no, hope this don't happen to me. It won't. If you're in Christ, it will not happen to you. I promise you. The Spirit of God, and, and people say, well, but, but can Christians be demon-filled? Absolutely, positively not. The Holy Ghost is not up for co-renting. <laughs> he lives in you. He's not going to co-rent out part of you, okay? Now, Christians can be demon-oppressed. I understand that. Satan wants to oppress us and tear us down. But we cannot be demon possessed, okay? So this is not something, and it's not saying that Saul was demon possessed. It's that with the Spirit of God removed from him, Saul was able to act more like Saul, which opened him up to the uh, attacks of Satan. And so, uh, so I do want to say that first that, that 
that, that those that are in Christ can never, ever, ever have the Spirit of God removed from them. He's, his empowerment, his enablement, just like David was enabled, now he is unenabled, and his own nature comes shining through. Verse 15 through 19. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. What they probably really want to say is, Boss, you need to repent, but you know, he ain't no mood. He's a man that kills people. He's not a nice guy, if Saul's not. Let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, this group of men that love you, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on the harp. Now, if you have a different translation, it does not say harp. It probably says lyre or guitar, okay? Because it's a, it's a guitar basically with two necks on it. And David was very skilled, evidently, in playing, writing music, singing songs to God out there in the field by himself. But he's got a lot of time, doesn't he, on his hands. So he writes songs and stuff. And so, a uh, cunning player on the harp, and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. I love this. I'll, wait, I'll, let me finish reading first. And Saul said to his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Then after one of his servants, Well, I've already got a guy in mind. Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite. So evidently this person's responsibility was look over and collect taxes over there. And he's ran to David. And he says, Hey, this guy can really play. He's something else. Not only that, he's a man of war. I heard about him killing a bear and killing a lion. And he's prudent in marriage. He's not bad to run his mouth. And he's a, he's a good looking enough person. He's a comely person. And most of all, are you ready for this? The servant of Saul says, and the Lord is with him. God's hand is on him. Saul therefore sent messengers unto Jesse and said, send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. Now I don't know if this guy knew that he was the shepherd of the family. But somehow Saul knows that's where he's going to find Je he's going to find David. He's the guy. He's the young son. He's with the sheep. So, I love this. Saul is introduced to young David. And he's not coming there to help lead armies. He's coming there for worship music. It makes the evil spirits flee. Let me tell you something. If you're having a bad day this day or next week or any day that you have in your life, you're having a bad day, put you some worship music on. That's what, that's what Paul says in the New Testament. Be not drunk with wine, where it says, but be ye being filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's God's Word. You want the Holy Ghost to move in your life? Sing songs to God. And I thought about two of my favorite songs, how different they are. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing was written 250 years ago. <laughs> it's still a good song, isn't it? Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. To my heart to sing thy word. And then a, one of my new favorite songs was written in 2003, so it's only 20 years old. It says, uh, How deep the Father's love for me. How vast beyond all measure. I love that. That he will give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. And then every word of that song is just a winner. It just... He said, wow, the choir sang it a couple weeks ago. And I could hardly keep my head straight just listening to the song, just praising God. Listen, you need, you're having a bad day? I'll tell you how to get out of it. Listen to some good, don't, don't go down and put CCR. I love CCR. Debbie knows I do, okay? But if you're having a bad day, CCR ain't going to make you feel no better. <laughs> you don't know about the poor boy on the street and the nickel and all that. You don't know all them songs, okay? What you need is a song about Jesus. You need a song about the fellowship of the Lord together. You need a song about God moving in your life. Now, my taste may not be like yours because my favorite go-to, in fact, my favorite version of How Deep the Father's Love is, is a bluegrass. I, I really like some of y'all. Oh, gosh, I wouldn't listen to that. But, but I, you listen to your kind. I listen to my kind. But the thing of it is, Chuck, it fills my heart up, man. I know you're a worship leader. It fills my heart up when I, when I get that worship in my heart, you know. So, anyhow, yeah. so... Uh, so he, he meets David, he meets David for the first time. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread, a whole lot of bread, and a bottle of wine, a skin of wine, and a kid, a young goat, and sent them by David, his son, unto Saul. So this is probably the same year. David's still about 15 years old or so. 
And David came to Saul and stood before him. And he loved him greatly. This is not Saul loving David, though he probably did. David loved Saul. That's the Hebrew. David loved Saul. And he became his armor bearer. At some point later on, he's actually going to be one that is willing to die with Saul as, as, as Saul's armor bearer. And Saul said to Jesse, said, Let David, I pray, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. So maybe that's what the brothers think. He was anointed to go be part of the court of David, of Saul. But he's, he is learning. Can you imagine what great learn, leadership ability this is to be able to sit there and watch how a kingdom runs, how people come together, how taxes are paid. David's getting free education isn't he? from the guy that's no longer. He, he's the king, but he's getting free education from the guy that used to be the king that don't know he ain't the king no more. You know, so it's pretty cool how God does stuff. It came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took a harp, his guitar, and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed, and it was well. And the evil spirit departed from him. I guess so. Devils cannot hang around when you're singing about God. When you're singing <coughs> songs of God, the devil cannot hang around. He can't stand it. And now the Philistines gathered together their armies, because there's more than one army. The Philistines are not a united people always. And we're gathered together at Succoth, that's about 15 miles from Bethlehem, and which belonged to Judah, and pitched between Succoth and Ezekiah. In, and you can guess that one, Ezadamanim, your guess is as good as mine. And Saul said to the men of Israel, we're gathered together, and, pitch, and, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and pitched by the valley of Elah. So they're about a quarter mile or so apart, maybe half a mile, I've been there to the valley. Uh, some on one hill, the Philistines on the other hills, and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on one on a mountain, and on the, on the other side, and the Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them, a good place for battle. And there came out a champion out of the out of the camp of the Philistines. Pretend like you've never heard this story before. Are you ready? This guy's name is Goliath. His name means the Splendid One. I mean, that's a cool name. That's a really cool name. He is Goliath, the Splendid One of Gath, whose height was six cubic and a span. He's, he is nine foot six inches tall. That's a big old boy. And he ain't a big, awkward, clumsy guy. It's a man of war. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head and armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bread, 125 pounds. 125 pound metal coat on top of it. He had greaves of brass upon his legs, on his, for his shin guards, and a target of brass, or actually better translation, a brass javelin between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. Well, I don't know what a weaver's beam is. That didn't help me very much. It evidently is about as big as most men's wrists, bigger than my wrist because I've got a small wrist, but a big uh, uh, that big around. And the spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. That's 15 pounds. I do know this. I knew one man in my whole life, and uh, his name was Cecil. I forget his last name now. Lived up there where... where, uh, where Tammy and, uh, Tammy and Mike lived for a long time. Cecil could take a 15-pound sledgehammer with one hand, take it by the main end of it, that part of his hand hanging over, and lift it straight up like that. And I thought, whoa, nobody else could do that that I know. That's, that's a big... So this guy's carrying around a 15-pound spearhead with him. And he cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine and you servants of Saul? Choose your man for you and let him come down to me. Thus don't have a lot of bloodshed. And if he be able to fight with me to kill me, we're going to fight to death, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. Now that's not unheard of. The Philistines were descendants of the Greeks. And uh, and if you remember, uh, see who was it? Uh, uh, I was like to think about the, the famous battle between when they stopped the battle and, a, and Achilles, uh, Achilles and uh, Hector went to battle and that was supposedly stopped the whole fight. So the, they're used to this. So the Philistines say, this is a better way. Let's not kill each other. Let's just let one person die. And, if, and by the way, in chapter, uh, in, the, in, in 2 Samuel, there's going to, chapter 2, there's going to be a time when the Jews practice this. 
and they're ready to go to their civil war against each other. And they said, let's just choose 12 young men and let these 12 young men settle the battle. Instead, that way it needs to kill several hundred people. But anyhow, Philistine said, here's what gets, gets me. And it got David too when he heard it later. I defy the armies of Israel, the covenant of Israel this day. Give me a man and we may fight together. When Saul and I, all Israel heard this, heard these, those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed. What's your translation say, Jeremy? They were dismayed and greatly afraid. Dismayed, dismayed okay. It didn't it lost their courage. Lost their terrified. Terrified, okay. It, the dismayed means beat down. It's literally just a word that means to knock somebody down over and over. They were, they were, and I felt that way. I felt beat down before. All of us have. If you say you're not, you've never felt beat down, I don't believe you. You ain't lived long enough. You ain't, you ain't faced, faced enough of this life out there. You will get beat down by life sometimes. But you know what? And they were greatly afraid. Greatly afraid. But had not Caleb and Joshua been giant killers before? It's in Israel's blood to be giant killers. But nobody will move out. Not even King Saul, who's about six foot eight. He's head and shoulders taller than all the rest of the Jews. Now David, we'll go back to David now, was a son of the Ephronite Bethlehem Judah, like we didn't already know this, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons. And the man went among men for uh, an old man in the days of Saul. So Jesse is an old man, which means he's at least older than Saul. So he's probably about 70. So that's when you know, he has all these oldest sons and stuff like that. And the three eldest sons of Jesse followed Saul to battle. And the names of those th his three sons that went to battle were uh, Elab, the, fir the firstborn. Next to him was Abinadab. And the third was Shema. And David was the youngest. And the three elders followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep in Bethlehem. So David would only stay there with Saul. He wasn't a permanent <coughs> fixture there in the court of Saul. But he would go back and forth because he could be back there. It's, all, it's less than a day's journey, about eight miles from Bethlehem uh, to Gibeah where Saul is. So he could go back and forth and you know, do that. So uh, it's not like he stayed all the time. So, so some time has passed. Most people think that maybe... At this point, from the time that he was anointed and his son before Saul, now a couple, three more years have passed, so David's turned into, he's not 20 yet, he's not old enough to go to battle yet. So he's still under 20, but his jaw squared up and he's got a little hair on his face, you know, he's starting to turn into a man. In fact, that might help you understand when we get next week over there, because, because Saul says, who is this guy? <laughs> and you know he knows David. You know, even though he'd been in a bad mindset. But, yeah, we'll get to that next week, the Lord's will. And, uh, but David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep in Bethlehem. There are two or three more verses here. And the Philistines drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. So nobody's really wanting to fight too bad, are they? So they keep bringing supplies and people are eating. But nobody's going out and killing each other unless there might be some skirmishes we don't read about. But the big battle's not set in array. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now thy brethren, ephah, of, uh, of this parched corn. That would be about half a bushel, so pretty heavy. And these ten loaves of bread, and run to the camp of thy brethren. And carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of the thousand. You know, I always want to butter up the bosses, you know. So the captain of the, not the captain of their hundreds, but the captain of their thousand. Take them a special gift. And look how thy brother fare, and take their pledge. Take what they need me to send them next time, okay? Take their pledge. Because there wasn't these central commissary or quartermaster so set up like this so and David rose early in the morning oh excuse me okay and, and now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines really not fighting but they're there okay so David rose up early a long walk in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went and Jesse as Jesse commanded him. I love David, don't you? He's always, even though he's the king, he knows he's the king. He's been the king for probably about two to three years now. In his heart, he knows. Now, I'm also convinced that that's what helped him. And that, Let me go to my last lesson in case we don't get there this evening. That's this right here. David was able to walk with God in spite of not being recognized as king he never overstepped his will even when he's around Saul he loves Saul because he has a future hope 
And that kept him faithful through all the trials that he had. And I put, that's a great lesson for me and a great lesson for you. You know what to help us through our present trials? No matter how small or how large they are? No, we have a future hope, hallelujah. That ought to carry us through. It carried David through. I, I have no doubt about that. He rose early in the morning and did what his daddy told him to do. He came to the trench, the battle lines, as the host was going forth to fight and, sh and, and shouted for the battle. Maybe they're actually going to fight this day. He doesn't know. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage, what he brought, carried a lot, pretty heavy, in the hand of the keeper of the carriage. So there's somebody that watches over everybody's food, probably more than one, several. And he ran to, into the army and came and saluted his brothers. And as he talked with them, this is their last verse tonight, Behold, there came up the champion of the Philistines of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. That giant's going to be sorry. At the end. <laughs> David heard them. Hey, there would already been thousands of them here. Jonathan, who was a true man of God, Jonathan hadn't been moved by God to go out and face them. And remember, Jonathan, no coward. Twice already we've seen Jonathan lead men into battle and God's hand be upon Jonathan for great and unbelievable victories. Even when nobody else would go with him but one kid, his armor bearer, Jonathan would go to battle, wouldn't he? So God's evidently not speaking to Jonathan to do this because he hasn't. But nobody stepped up. But David hears the call. David heard it. Uh, all right, so, all right, so, we have this battle that's set in array that's really not fighting yet. And Jesse, I read somebody, and I'm going to read this, this silly thing at one of the commentaries I read, said, Jesse chose the perfect day to send David to take provisions to his sons. <laughs> I don't think Jesse had any idea what he was doing. He was just sending some bread for the sons and cheese for the officer. God had a plan for this young boy, this young teenage boy, to change the world. He had a plan for this young boy to be recognized by the nation finally. Years of secrecy, at least two or three years of secrecy. Now David's still not going to tell everybody that he's king. That, this won't happen for many more years, okay? But... Anyhow, do y'all know though the end of the story? It's pretty cool. Go ahead and read the end up, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you the part of it, okay? This little boy's going to kill that big giant. And when he kills him, first he's going to knock him down with a rock. Well, I'm not kidding with a rock. I know it's hard to believe you can't bother to believe a story like this. He's going to knock this big giant down with all this metal and stuff. going to knock him down with a rock. And the giant's running at him, so he falls forward. And David's going to climb up on top of this fellow take the giant sword and cut his head off and carry it around for days. Blood dripping out. Oh, there ain't no blood left. Just no white face there looking at him when he carries it around. And he carries it around. Finally, he, he takes it and gives it to the people of Jerusalem. He says, look what I got here, man. How big is that guy's head? If he's, not, he's got a big old hog head, don't he? He's got a big old head to be toting around like that. Anyhow, it's a cool story. Lord's willing, we'll get into it next week our heads together for prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for your blessings. For just a few of these lessons that, that I had, Lord God, and I'm sure the Holy Ghost spoke more lessons than that to the people here tonight, the people that will listen later. Father, I pray, help us to bring glory to you. Never be ashamed. Never be ashamed of keeping sheep or digging wells or whatever you tell us to do. Let us do it with all of our heart. Let us be like David. Let us do it early. Get up and do what you tell us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.